Thank you everyone. On behalf of the India Oxford Initiative, a very warm, warm welcome to this hybrid event. We are delighted to have with us two distinguished guests today. Uh, Chaitanya Sambrani, Associate Professor of the Australian National University, is an art historian and curator with special interests in modern and contemporary art. His work includes several publications and exhibitions in Australia, India, China, Korea, Singapore, and the US. And sorry, Chadan, if I've left out some others, um, focusing on just three from his impressive list of curatorial projects. I would like to especially note in 2012, he curated to let the world in narrative and beyond in contemporary Indian art. This show was installed in Chennai. In 2010, he curated in Shanghai the exhibition titled Place, Time, Play, Contemporary Art from the West Heavens to the Middle Kingdom. And between 2004 and 2007, his exhibition Edge of Desire, Recent Art in India toured across various cities, including Perth, New York, Mexico City, Berkeley, New Delhi, and Mumbai. And I'm pretty sure I left some out there. Also with us today is my eminent colleague, Jeffrey Batchen, Professor of Art History of Art at uh, Oxford and a specialist in the history of photography. He is the author of a long list of publications, but today I'm going to plug his current exhibitions on view at the Western Library in Oxford. The first of these is titled A New Power, Photography in Britain, 1800 to 1850, and the second, Bright Sparks, Photography and the Talbot Archive at the Bodleian Archive, um, Bodleian Library. If you've not been there yet, please go. My name is Malika Kumbera Landris. I am Keeper of the Eastern Art Department at the Ashmolean and the Chair of INDOX, the India Oxford Initiative a hub to coordinate India-related activities in Oxford, as well as a mechanism to build and develop partnerships between Oxford and individuals in India. Welcome to all our viewers, both virtual and those of you who joined us here in person at the Ashmolean. Over to you, Chaitanya. Thank you so very much, Malika. Such a warm welcome, and uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and a privilege to uh, be here with all of you today, uh, those in the room and those online. I'd like to commence by uh, making an acknowledgement of the country on which I live and work. Um, I live and work on unceded lands of the Nanawal and Nagri people in Canberra, Australia, and um, I pay tribute to um, their ongoing tradition their creativity, innovation, and resilience. Um, and uh, it is um, with, with due regard to that country um, on which I live uh, that I speak here on other lands, about other lands. The worlding of South Asian art and questions of representation. Uh, the South is within parentheses because there are other ways of thinking about these categories, and um, uh, it is by no means certain that, um, that South Asia is, is necessarily a uh, geographically or um, culturally um, coherent category. Uh, as many of us know, um, these categories, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, etc., um, are at least partially the product of um, uh, the World War, uh, the Second World War, and uh, the result of uh, Allied Naval Command in Colombo um, under the leadership of MacArthur. Um, where these categories uh, first sort of started being used um, in, in public life. Um, the modernity and con contemporaneity of cultural expressions from Asia and other parts of the non-Western world started being acknowledged by major institutions in the developed world some four decades ago today. It is now increasingly common to see contemporary art from previously peripheral locations featured among exhibitions of a worlded contemporary art system. Discernible in the seemingly insatiable appetite for luxury consumption at burgeoning art fairs, 
or in the aspirational accumulation of cultural capital in a bienalized world, dealers, curators, critics, academics, collectors are increasingly confident in their inclusion of art from previously marginalized locations. Um, this is a screenshot from a website called the BNLFoundation.org. Um, if you were to scroll down alphabetically and count it up, there are upwards of 200 locations uh, numbered on this map. This map is uh, interactive. You can spin it around and, and focus on different parts of the world. Uh, upwards of 200 reiterative exhibitions globally. Not all of them are biennales. Some are triennales, some are quadrennales, some are other things. But there are some 200 such things. And of course, Europe is the most highly biennialized part of the world. We need that map. The academic field that we are talking about was inaugurated in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The International Conference Modernism and Postmodernism in Asian Art, which took place at the ANU in 1991, convened by John Clark, spoke of a nascent field at that time of gathering of energies across several locations uh, on the peripheries of Asia, Australia being one. For instance, the artist regional exchange that took place in Perth, Western Australia between 1987 and 1999, the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art inaugurated in Brisbane in 1993, proceedings of the 1991 conference, um, the first academic conference on modernity in Asian art was published under that title, Modernity in Asian Art in 93 followed soon after by Tradition and Change, Contemporary Art of Asia and the Pacific, edited by Caroline Turner, also later on went on to be at ANU. Um, even as the world began to understand the implications of 1989, and I mean Beijing and Berlin, and 1991, Moscow, Baghdad, Sarajevo, Australian-based scholars, museums and artists initiatives were declaring their affiliations with a long overdue revision and realignment of the histories of modernist and contemporary visual art. An Australian historical positionality remains clearly implicit here, with geographic, economic and political factors underpinning the valency of research into Asian modernities, which largely preceded similar initiatives in Europe and North America, with the exception of perhaps New York's Asia Society under the leadership of Vishaka Desai in the early 1990s. The ongoing participation of non-Euro-American artists and indeed the legitimate aspiration of non-Euro-American individuals and cultures to full participation in the processes of modernity has been largely written out of histories, mainstream histories of modernism. The process of revision and realignment that the work of John Clark and other colleagues um, has, has undertaken has been accompanied also by a process of recuperation, of writing back at history and at what Nibel Chakravarti went on to call the provincialization of Europe. So provincialism as a problem articulated by another Australian, Terry Smith, in 77. And then Dipesh Chakravarti also writing from, at that time, an Australian locus, he was at that time at ANU, uh, speaking about the artifice of history within which different kinds of provincialities are elided, uh, chief among them the provinciality of Europe. And provincializing Europe then becomes the major project that uh, Chakravarti uh, would like us to embark upon to problematize the sovereign theoretical subject of all histories, including the ones that are called other histories. Since 1994, the Japanese contemporary artist Yanagi Yukinori has undertaken a series of collaborations with a creature that manifests several traits that we associate with ourselves. Communal living, cooperative organization, a hierarchy, a hierarchized division of labor, modes of communication, aggressive and sometimes violent competition against other communities and to do many things that we do. 
Um, his ant farms are basically assemblages of colored sand approximating different national maps into which a colony of ants is introduced. And as the ants go about their business, they do what we do. They travel, they move, they migrate, they carry stuff with them. Slowly, as the ants make their way through the labyrinth, the world, as they world this world into their own, those markers of national identification erode, deteriorate, disappear. In the work of N.S. Harsha, uh, an artist from India, this is work that was installed in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2007, titled Nations. The messiness of nationhood and the instability of those constructs through which we construct worlds comes to the fore. Harsha's work shows us that both the formation of nations and the process of decolonization that we like to speak about nowadays remain works in progress and fundamentally always incomplete. The work highlights entanglements, it highlights connections. What at a distance appears to be a well resolved set of discrete national emblems turns out upon closer inspection to be entirely an untidy mesh, the work of a thousand demented spiders. The nature of the world and conditions of belonging was part of the reflection um, that the contemporary Chinese artist Wu Wenda undertook when he was invited to um, one of the National Gallery of Australia's inaugural contemporary Asian commissions. It took the NGA until 2001 to have an Asian contemporary artist in residence. And Gu Wenda, um, ever the um, adept showman, uh, issued a call uh, on Triple J Youth Radio for people to donate their hair. And this hair was uh, woven, meshed, tangled up into these large curtains in which Gu denounced us Australians as being this vestige of British genetic material lost somewhere in the Pacific. Um, I don't quite agree with Mr. Gu, but he has the privilege of speaking. Um, denouncing Australia at the turn of the 21st century as geographically Pacific and genetically British was part of his ongoing series of these United Nations monuments. He hopes to have one for every member of the United Nations in time, in new time. On the other hand, the work of much younger Chiu Anshong, Cubic Globes from 1972, which was part of a project that I curated, Malika referred to, um, invokes an ancient Chinese understanding of square earth and round heaven. Under that square earth, the Middle Kingdom slash through the rectangle is the ideogram for the middle kingdom, square earth, and the middle of the earth is Zhou. Chiu Anshang's cubic globes subvert contemporary geographical alignments. Um, these alternative configurations of the world seemingly reproduce truthfully political, ge geological, climatological, topographical, and other scientific dimensions of the earth. Each of those images on those cubic globes uh, pertains to a relatively precise um, way of measuring uh, wind patterns, for instance, or depth or height above the sea level, etc. However, we find that relationships of cognateness, centrality, marginality, distance, they're all rendered askew. On these flat-faced earths, there are other theories of distance spatial, cultural, political relationships. As ongoing realignments of global power and looming contests over scarce resources redraw the political and economic landscape, we are asked to reconsider the notion of worlding. On the face of these cubic globes, all conceits, all worldings are forever doomed to marginality, forever tentative always on the edge and in danger of being flung off the surface if the earth were to rotate. 
the sense of tentativeness, the sense of an open-ended search is implicit in the uh, Conference of Birds work by Ali Kazim that was shown here at this museum in 2022. Um, that was the first for this museum as well. Uh, I believe the first South Asian contemporary show uh, to take place at the Ashmolean 2022, last year. That should tell us something. Um, the Conference of Birds refers to a, a Sufi parable um, uh, about the, the search for truth, about um, the quest for enlightenment. Um, the hoopoe, which is flying off the left edge over there, the wisest of all birds in uh, Persian um, understandings of the natural world, uh, leads the others on a quest for the Simurg, um, for enlightenment. Simurg actually means 30 birds, and so there are 30 birds that set, set off on this quest, and, and the ultimate, the end of the quest is, in fact, a stage of looking within yourself. Um, enlightenment is within, not without. So you go through various travails, go through the different valleys, if you like, um, quest of love, of belonging, of hopelessness, etc. Um, to arrive at an understanding of yourself um, beyond annihilation. So there is a sense that these traditions of other ways of thinking about the world, other ways of travel, other ways of traversing different terrains, um, have something very important to, to, to remind us of. Um, Ali Kazim's Bird Hunter series deploys a particularly highly polished monochrome ground um, as the inscrutable scene upon which a strange drama plays out. Um, these three paintings play with our expectations of what might be the relationships that uh, exist between human and non-human characters. Um, we are led to imagine the drama of the hunt where the human camouflages himself um, in the headdress of a bird, perhaps in the process becoming somewhat bird-like. The third work invites us to speculate on relationships surrounding servitude and domesticity, where this dark-skinned man, not particularly prosperous himself, gazes fixedly at the captive avian at the other end of the stick, both captives in some way against the azure ground that mimics and exceeds the blueness of the sky. So these relationships of boundedness, captivity, are part of that question mark around worlding. Uh, Rina Kalat's 2018 work, Woven Chronicle, is manufactured out of recycled fishing nets and bits of plastic ephemera alongside um, circuit boards and uh, speakers that are embedded within this upside down world. Um, we are reminded, of course, that there is no right way up world. Um, any, any, any map of the world uh, that we have conventionally grown to understand as north up is precisely only conventional. Um, this is supposed to be a corrective projection proposed by another Australian called MacArthur in 73, a universal corrective projection of the map of the world with the south up to get us to think again about things that we take for granted. Um, because in space, there are no up and down and we don't walk on our heads down under. So, um, Kalat's map of the, Saini Kalat's map of the world um, speaks about trade routes ancient and modern ways of worlding. Speaks about the economics and politics of connections and connectivities. There are real and imaginary roots picked out in barbed wire and punctuated by a multi multilingual soundtrack of conversations and, and interrogations at border crossings. So if you were to stand in front of the work, you would hear voices in Italian, Spanish, German, English, primarily European languages, asking you, why are you here? Who do you know? 
How long will you stay? The specter of national sovereignty continues to haunt any imagination of worlding. In the work of Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh, um, born 37, so um, sense of generations and so on, um, there, there has been a long and ongoing meditation on configurations of the world. He's been working with the Ebstor of Mapamundi, um, one of a, a number of celebrated medieval world maps, which were typically drawn east up and Jerusalem at the center. Um, in medieval Mapamundi, um, the uh, very top of the map would actually be the face of Christ. Um, his stigma bearing hands at the sides, which one of which is visible over here, and his feet at the very bottom, which are also visible here. But the face of Christ has been replaced by a globe containing the image of a double-headed deer, a golden deer. The golden deer that Rama of the Mahabharata went questing after there. It's a kind of mirage. The map is populated by sometimes recognizable and at other times uh, strange iconographies, depending on um, who, who is looking. Um, at the cardinal points, um, that is east. Yeah. Uh, at the cardinal points, um, we have Kabir, the medieval saint poet, uh, based on a uh, Mughal miniature, late Mughal miniature of the 18th century. A dancing Pahari um, man, um, the Mary Magdalene from Giotto's Nolimi Tangere of the early uh, 14th century, and another Mughal image of Majnu uh, in chains being led to the tent of Laila by an old woman. And in this spectrum of divided lands, of diverse traditions, European traditions, Asian traditions, um, where St. Francis feeds the birds and Rama chases the deer alongside each other, there is the possibility of thinking about worlds that are multifarious, worlds that are not singular, worlds that are open and capacious, that are hospitable in all their terror. City dreams, memory dreams, desire statues and ghosts, the return of Huynh Sang, that, that whole thing, believe me, is the title of the work. From 2010, um, Sheikh is using the great Giles system of Romanization, uh, whereas today we would render that name Xuan Sang. Um, this is a, a what if, what if work. What if that traveler who crossed the Himalaya came to the Western paradise uh, looking for the Tripitaka? looking for the canonical texts of Buddhism, traveled across the mountains, and what if he were to return to India in 2010? What would he see? Um, this cityscape is derived actually from Google Earth, and it has been completely fleshed out uh, using various kinds of materials and, and um, uh, various kinds of uh, methods, in, in, uh, sometimes in, in low relief. Um, but it is a city that has been cut open. It has been rendered asunder because in 2002, uh, that city, alongside several others, underwent cataclysmic violence uh, directed against Muslims, orchestrated by the state, um, the, the orchestrated by, by the state that is supposed to look after its citizens. Um, this kind of genocidal violence uh, marks that that. The, the urban fabric and marks the possibility of belonging in the world, uh, especially from, from uh, minority uh, loci. From, uh, uh, the, the spread of Buddhism is one kind of worlding that, that might have taken place in the ancient world. And, and here you have a reminder of that, that spread, that, that return. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a collapse of place and time into an amalgam uh, that that is on the one hand manifestly pluralistic, but on the other reminds us constantly of the um, uh, 
tremendous violence that has gripped many parts of the world uh, in, in the name of belonging and unbelonging. Uh, Gandhi and Gaga of 2014 speaks about uh, the age of exploration through to the age of colonization. The two figures, uh, the one on your right is Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer that found a way to the Indies, 1498, uh, not long after Columbus um, misdiscovered America in 1492. Um, and on the other side, on your left, seated, the seated figure is the young Mohandas Karamchandandi, recently returned from South Africa, soon after 1915. Um, he has just only just learned to um, um, dress in this particular fashion. This is based on a drawing of Gandhi made by Banindranath Tagore. Um, and, but I, can't, I don't have time to tell you that story right now. Uh, but this is Gandhi before he becomes the Mahatma. And the two of them contemplate this, this map of the world, this map of what is to be between the process of exploration, colonization and decolonization. The arrival of Vasco da Gama in 1498, uh, presumably inaugurates another sort of worlding of, of um, Asia. Uh, Pushkumala in 2014, um, at the same exhibition that this work was shown, undertook a reenactment of the presumed arrival of Vasco da Gama at the court of the Samarin of Calicut. Um, that, that is herself, actually, uh, playing Vasco. Um, and uh, various other members are all part of the Bangalore arts community. Uh, many, many old friends uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the photograph. Uh, Ushmamala's um, methodology is kind of a twice imagined one because the image itself is based on an 1898 painting by Jose Veloso Salgado, who could not possibly have attended the arrival of Vasco da Gama 100 years later. So Veloso Salgado imagines what things might have been like at the court of the Zamorin of Calicut in 1498. And based on that oil on canvas um, in, in the Geographical Society of Lisbon, uh, Pushpamala undertakes to recreate um, the mise en scene and, and then goes ahead to display it together with all the uh, theatrical backdrops. Uh, here you see the, the lion, there, there it is, and the window through which the world is seen on the other side. Uh, so the whole thing is opened out, analyzed. Uh, the kind of forensic methodology at work that pieces together from after effects a sequence of actions that took place at some point in time, presumably. Like dismantling a machine to learn the principles of engineering. This kind of reenactment um, accompanies a practice of citation that you know many of the artists have been talking about um, uh, uh, do follow and appropriation. Uh, proceeding through a careful exploration of prior acts of visualization, uh, attentive to uh, backgrounds, att attentive to previous gestures, attenting, attentive to the fact that former acts of expression, as Merleau Ponty put it, establish between speaking subjects a common world to which the words being uttered refer. So the construction of words through acts of reiteration. Uh, this, this kind of construction of the world, uh, this kind of worlding from within, if you like, um, is especially pertinent to South Asian traditions, uh, which are characterized by, uh, to my mind at least, complex accretions of impulses and influences. Despite the tendency to see traditions in singular envelopes, um, they remain, I suggest, site of vexations due to their mobilization for various kinds of political projects, including that of nation building. Uh, in the context of colonization, another kind of uh, empire building. Uh, in recent decades, the rise of fundamentalist politics, which sees the fabrication of monolithic tradition being 
uh, invoked in service of a Hindu cultural hegemony. The vertically disjointed and fragmented appearance of this culture, Colonial Sisters of 2008, by um, another artist from Bangalore, Tallur. It's not actually from Bangalore precisely, but yes, close enough. Um, he, he often employs skilled craftspeople to, to make, to actually um, carve his, carve his uh, materials. Um, in, in, in this particular case, uh, he has chosen craftspersons belonging to distinct traditions, uh, different kinds of skills with materials and figurative idioms. Uh, one more classical and the other more folk, if you like, uh, which is a particular, particularly sort of persistent misalignment uh, within within the uh, construction of Indian tradition, where uh, the classical is supposed to uh, occupy a hierarchically superior position to uh, folk art, and um, this sort of art craft divide that is far more um, um, uh, complicated uh, than 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 uh, simply simply the presence of artistic and craft type act activities, also because of the way in which it is um, written into different uh, linguistic uh, registers and uh, in the way in which it uh, uh, corresponds to different caste uh, uh, occupation roles. So this is this is a, a kind of uh, bilateral a study in bilateral this visual misalignment. Um, and a beguiling invitation to play with building blocks to try your hand at reconstructing the image from from um, uh, the work um, uh, that that is supposed to be interactive. Um, it was without saying that it is technically impossible to put it back together again. Um, you know, a bit like the Humpty Dumpty story. Um, there, there is no way in which you can make the world whole again. There's no way in which you can sort of put these things back. Acts of restitution, of 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 reinstallation, uh, remain always tentative. Remain always um, already impossible. I'd like to consider the work of um, the Indonesian artist Agus Suwagi for for a moment, um, where we are talking about the, the intellectuality of art forms with colonial sisters, for instance, between the so-called classical and the so-called folk, uh, but also within within the work of um, artists from other parts of Asia. Uh, the the author. Um, who, who makes himself known, that's actually a self-portrait uh, of, of Suwagi's, uh, alongside um, that of a forebear, uh, that's Radhan Saleh, um, the first um, person from the Dutch East, East Indies to um, actually practice as a professional artist in Europe in the 1830s through to the 18, through to 1851. So 21 years of um, professional practice as a full-time artist um, in, in uh, Netherlands and Germany. Um, this fragment of a library after Radhan Saleh um, reflects upon ways of thinking about historical location, ways of thinking about the Indies. Uh, ways of thinking about um, these faraway places where where the presence of Bogan's um, uh, um, wife, uh, mistress, Bogan's girl, uh, the presence of Radhan Saleh as the sort of inaugural speaking subject of the Indies uh, working in the West, uh, come into an easy collision with each other. Radhan Saleh's Flood in Java, the lithograph on your left, is an overt homage to Jericho's Love to the Medusa, uh, except that uh, Radhan Saleh's work is a, a lithograph of, of 32 centimeters high by 44. Uh, Jericho's is a gargantuan machine, um, about five meters high by seven meters wide. Uh, so it is completely duplicate of me to actually put them on the same screen like this, side by side. Because if you were to see them in real life, that would not be the case. Um, but it brings us to that that familiar problem in the in the worlding of um, um, non-European art, where the the paradigmatic story that that we work with is first in Europe and then elsewhere, as um, as put 
as it is put by the Pesh Chakravarti. Everything happens first in Europe and then elsewhere. Um, so uh, here we have actually an illustration of first in Europe and then elsewhere. Um, and and uh, Raden Salo is, is, this, is this first Asian man who uh, makes his presence felt as a professional artist in Europe in the 1830s in a production circuit, dissemination circuit that is dominated by figures such as Jericho, also the Lacroix, Vanet and others. So it's deeply ironic and yet a persistent feature of post-colonial nation states that the inherited structures of power, whether they are of feudal economies dominated by princely states, legitimized through different degrees of benevolent monarchy or not so benevolent monarchy, or of colonial apparatus of administration and governance, all of these find a place within the formation of the independent post-colonial republic. So the minor prince, um, Raden Saleh Syarif Bustaman, um, member of a small royal family in central Java, who goes on to become a professional artist in Europe, becomes the parad paradigmatic uh, speaking subject of the Dutch East Indies, uh, the beginning of um, uh, speech from that locus. Uh, in the work of much younger artist Zico Alwaikuni, uh, born 87, um, there is a reflection on the archipelago of the day before, um, with due wink wink to Umberto Eco, uh, not just an island of the day before, but an entire archipelago of the day before. Um, 2019, uh, the work speaks about uh, various stereotype conceits within the history of a world that contemporary art. Uh, you have the interior of the art gallery with incessant repetition of a particular um, theme, if you like, within the, um, within the tutelage of um, Indonesian school uh, curricula in art. How do you draw a landscape? Two peaks, one river, sun between them, rainbow. Uh, there is a formula that is how the land is, that is your country. Um, within which there is the installation of a derivation of a derivation. I mean by here uh, the work of Michael Stevenson, an artist from Aotearoa, New Zealand, who undertook to recreate forensically, like Pushpamala recreated uh, the arrival of Vasco da Gama, Stevenson undertook to recreate the journey of Ian Fairweather, who tried to smuggle himself uh, in the route that is opposite to the one taken by uh, asylum seekers these days. Uh, tried to sail from Darwin to Timor, uh, ended up in Bali, uh, completely lost, was arrested and deported to England because I was actually um, from the UK. So Fairweather's raft that was made out of various detritus of wartime materials uh, including um, fuel fuel canisters, these these tube-like things, and a parachute, um, becomes part of Albaikoni's uh, reflections on the archipelago of the day before. So also does um, the flood in Java, Raden Saleh channeling Jericho. So Raden Saleh cha channeling Jericho, um, the formulaic reproductions ad infinitum of the Sweet Indies landscape, um, the raft of the Argonaut, fair weather, and the barricade, the blockade uh, taken, undertake, undertaken by Australian uh, dock workers against Dutch shipping in 1945 when Indonesia declared its independence. And there was a moment of solidarity, uh, a rare moment of solidarity where dock workers from India, dock workers from Australia, dock workers from Indonesia, working across Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and other ports on the east coast of Australia, prevented the sailing of ships uh, that were trying to reprovision Dutch forces uh, in Indonesia, because Indonesia had um, declared independence in 45, even though the United Nations did not. Uh, accept that declaration until um, 1949. The very next year, and this is you know one of the stirring moments in in the worlding from 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 the margins, if you like, 
uh, Asun Sani and company, um, a group of um, uh, literary critics uh, and creative artists, uh, wrote a, a credo, uh, the Gelangdan Arena credo, which was published uh, October 1950, which starts with this extraordinary declaration, we are legitimate heirs of world culture, the world belongs to us. Uh, the post-colonial subjectivity inherits much more than the sum of its genetic parts. Um, our Indonesian character does not derive from our dark brown skins, but rather from what we emphasize in the expression of our feelings. Indonesian culture is determined by the combination of all sorts of stimulating voices. There is this, this extraordinary um, uh, declaration of belonging in the world. Um, not too dissimilar to what Sousa and company had declared in Bombay in 1949. Uh, um, we have no pretensions of making rapid revivals. We have studied all the schools of painting and sculpture to arrive at a vigorous synthesis. And so there is this sense of, you know, the color of my mind and the color of my skin are two different things. Um, so here I'd like to kind of leave you and, and invite um, our discussion because this, this, this kind of claim to belonging um, flies in the face of what Chakrabarti has called inequalities of ignorance. Inequalities of ignorance directed eastward from the self-appointed Euro-American centers of the art world. Um, John Clark speaks about this um, in terms of Euro-America, this hyper-real constellation of geography and power that um, lives around the North Atlantic. Um, characterized by a smug blindness with which scholars operate in ignorance of modernist histories among black, brown uh, people. Outside the Euro-American epistemological apparatus, on the other hand, there is acute awareness within most, if not all, Asian, African, Latin American art cultures, where the relationality is strangely aligned between the home culture call it China, call it India, and the West, whatever that is. With notable exceptions that have frequently originated in conflict and conquest, such as between Malaysia and Indonesia, between Cambodia and Laos, there is relatively little by way of comparative awareness directed within geographical and culturally cognate neighborhoods. Worldings continue to be haunted by us and the West with which we must catch up. So, focusing on examples from South and Southeast Asia, I've tried to offer some thoughts on the problems attendant on the worlding of contemporary art. The interplay between the local and the global is implicit here, uh, as are the multiple valencies of belonging and international representation in the production of meaning. Trying to turn away from the eternal present of a seemingly contextless contemporaneity into which we have arrived. and I'm moderating the discussion after that stimulating talk. Uh, as you know, we're in a hybrid situation, so we have people who are live in the audience, and we all have also have an online audience. I'd invite the online audience to send their questions through the chat function. And we are going to read out those questions as appropriate. Are there any questions in the audience while we're while Ma was uh, queuing up online questions? Anthony. Um, Firstly, what I think I'll do, Anthony, is repeat your question. So, uh, um, and just cheeky two questions. Firstly, Chitanya, thank you so much for that. That was really rich, really interesting, and so good to see that range of material um, presented here. Um, I was struck looking at the PowerPoint how many of the institutions, um, which institutions have collected this work, and thinking about another way of thinking about it really relating to the power plays currently at, at stake within some of those institutions. 
to be the regional sheriff or the regional player between Craig Goma, uh, Arcadia New South Wales, Atan in Jakarta, M plus, NGS, and so on. Just thinking about how you'd respond to their own grapplings for worldings through their own sense of power, regional control of, of artworks and therefore of art histories, and how artists are responding to that. So that might be one question. The second one is, let me give him one at a time. You have to answer up here so that people outside of the world can be. I invite you both to sit there because the camera is now on the table. All right. All right. Apologies. And is there, they can hear us? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, great question. Um, part of it has to do with infrastructure. Part of it has to do with the fact that uh, the collecting institutions that you've mentioned and you've seen in the in the PowerPoint, uh, National Gallery of Singapore, Marchan, M Plus, AGNSW, QAG, uh, they have the ability to make these collections happen. Um, there are other institutions that um, are are being built as we speak, uh, including one in Colombo that does not yet have the ability to make these collections happen. Uh, there are other institutions that are moribund, such as uh, the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi and the Gallery National Indonesia in, in Jakarta, uh, where, where the, where the uh, infrastructures have either not yet uh, come online or have in fact been completely submerged by bureaucrat bureaucratic interference, uh, political uh, stacking, literally, um, and they've stopped collecting things. Uh, so, so it is at one level not surprising that these are the works that are um, um, being. This is these are the locations at which works are being collected now. Um, you haven't mentioned Australia, and quite a few of the works you showed seem to be in Australian institutions. Yeah, that's right. Uh, AJ and SW and QAG. Yeah, Australia has become an important location where one can find this kind of work? Oh, absolutely. And as I said at the very beginning, it was, you know, back in back in the late 80s and 90s. It started in Australia, but then it started, you know, there was, there was the um, collections of contemporary, modern or contemporary Asian art um, being, being um, uh, initiated in the UK until fairly, fairly recently. Um, um, it, it seems that, that by virtue of its geographical location, but more more importantly, because of its economic and geopolitical location, um, it is it is um, it is at the at the sort of peripheries of Asia that these um, efforts seem to have commenced. Anthony, you had a second or a well, kind of bouncing off that actually, and that is that today in this morning's Times Higher Education, there was a report saying that Australia was turning away from um, supporting studies in, in, in China and South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and just thinking about, you know, you we talked about this on Saturday, your own background in, at ANU, which has long been a really important centre for thinking about Asian cultural histories and, and, and other ways of thinking about the global and the international from those peripheries. But now we're seeing something different happen, which is the emergence of things like the Ramsey Centre for the celebration of Western civilization, whatever that might be, um, and a decline in, in support, at least, infrastructurally, or uh, an awareness of what's happening within those regions. So it seems like quite a different shift, even from what you were saying about the late 80s, early 90s, and what was happening in institutions, obviously the Paul Keating government and so on, supporting a, an Asian-oriented um, sense of trade and, and cultural trade. I wonder if you could respond to that as well and some of the shifts that you've seen happening across those 30 years. Um, the, the Ramsey Centre was an interesting episode. Um, they, they, they actually... Um, you, better, you better explain to audiences. Yes, this was, was, this was an endowed, endowed <laughs> centre for the study of Western civilization, uh, And various uh, universities were offered um, the right to host this endowed centre. Quite a lot of um, money connected to that it. came with, yeah. Lots of money, um, and 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 many many universities turned away from the idea because the Ramsey Center was also premised upon a particular contractual agreement which would allow them to hire and fire staff um, outside the enterprise agreements of those universities, and so um, for 
you know, um, we, 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 we walked away from that and, and so did many other universities. Um, so so I, I think I think the, the I mean, at one level, the um, strength of the National Tertiary Education Union prevailed in that particular instance, the NTEU. Um, so the unions did uh, make a difference there. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen uh, increasingly uh, governments turning away from investing that uh, investing in, in areas that do not seem to yield immediate identifiable instrumental results. Um, the study of art is one of those areas. Um, there, there, there have been quite substantial uh, problems. I'm sure that there are there are problems um, in other parts of the world as well. Uh, and we have been um, um, trying to work across that. Yeah, it remains an ongoing battle. Yeah. Can I ask you what you see your own role as a curator? how you see your role as a curator in all of this. You had a, a wonderful quotation about the construction of vigorous synthesis mm. out of many voices. Is that how you see your own role? Or, I mean, mm. What is the worldly role of the curator as a worker within this dynamic that you described? Um, it, it, it's, it's primarily that of the, the, the provocateur sometimes. Um, that that challenges the audience, but also perhaps challenges the artists uh, to to move beyond um, the the, the um, usual format of uh, making work uh, in a particular fashion. Um, and as somebody who enables conversations, um, that that has to be um, front and center. I mean, is there a contradiction between? showing work that is so often about permeability of boundaries and the impossibility of singular identity and then putting them in an exhibition form where in effect your work is to make that coherent to add narrative to make it understandable how do you negotiate that tension yeah um it, it, it's 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 always a, a, a an ongoing um question it is uh, sometimes a bit like uh making films uh -huh. at, at some point, you have to say, "Okay, wrap." Uh -huh. um, and then, you know, there are sharp cut. Yeah, yeah, and there are there are splicings, and yeah. uh, you know, I like to think about it in you know, an analog fashion. Uh -huh. um, and a lot of stuff ends up on the floor of the editing room. Uh -huh. um, now, how do you negotiate the urge to tell people what it all means? I mean, this is always a curatorial yeah. question. Do you add text that explains everything or do you let the work do its own work? On the other hand, you've already, you might say, inserted yourself even by arranging work in certain ways. So I mean, one of these is a question from um, online. Just does one get lost in the meaning making of all of this? Yeah, yeah, and that... Does one have a light touch as a curator or does one impose a sort of meaning narrative on the work? Sure. Uh, the, the curator actually in a, in a museum context works within a very limited uh, purview. Uh, the, the conservators, the registrars, the lighting designers, <laughs> uh, trust the, the education uh, crew, um, the, no. uh, the Is this marketing. because you're a guest? I mean, you find um, being a even, guest curator is more difficult than if you were... Even a... my colleagues that work within the belly of the beast have, have very stringent um, um, limits within which they within which their operations work. So the curator is, you know, we we, we sort of think about curatorship as a kind of authorship. Um, but uh, I think I think in the actual workings of the museum, um, it may not be quite so. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you you're part of part of a sort of exhibition delivering machine. Um, so some of the work you showed. It does require a bit of historical contextualization, yeah. don't you think? I mean, yeah, yeah, so how does one absolutely. best provide that That's as a right. curator? And, and this is this is the ongoing question, which I call the problem of footnotes. Or, yes. or you, know, you can call it the inequality of ignorance, if you, if you yeah. follow Chakrabarti, because we, you know, when when we say Cezanne, I say Cezanne. Okay. What did I just say? Cezanne. Right? Uh, do I provide footnote now? Shall I shall I footnote Cezanne, uh, or shall I assume that it you know every every person in this room should understand what I mean when I say Cezanne? Um, but but on the other hand, when I say Al Baikuni, or I say you know, if I say Emir Yasser Nasser, um, 
the, the first um, list woman artist from Indonesia that we know of. Um, you know, a lengthy, lengthy series of footnotes is required. I mean, even to explain the significance of that boat, yeah. a replica of, or yeah. near replica of the one that Ian Fairweather once went in yeah. the opposite direction. Yeah. But that's an awful lot of text. On it the is platform. an awful lot of text, and yeah. and so 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 also so also is the Rodnia and Lastak in the work of George Braque. Yeah. It requires a lot of text. Uh -huh. And so, uh, and, and the, have a lot the, of text. The Mont Saint Betois of, of Cezanne that he returns to over and over and over again requires a lot of text that we have now taken as read. Uh -huh. Now take these things as read. But, you know, how did we come to take these things as read? How did we come to understand them as given? Okay, that took place through a process of acculturation. Yes. Uh, there is nothing self-evident about Mont Saint Saint uh, in and there is nothing self-evident about treat nature by the the cube, the the cone, and the cylinder. There is nothing self-evidently true about this when when Cezanne writes it. I mean, we we have come to understand this as the fundamental building blocks of modernism, but you know there was a process involved. I'm going to come back to the audience in a minute, so start preparing with some great questions, but. Got another question here from our online audience. And I, if I could sum it up, it's, it's one I'm sure you're familiar with, how you create an equitable um, relationship between local tradition and local meaning, international audience and global Biennale-like exhibitions. Um, this person has put it like this, can the unique native perspective and approach to visual expression of the South be brought to the international audience without cultural identity trapping and post-colonial debate. Now, you can interpret those last two parts however you like, but but I'm always interested in this the tension between maintaining some sense of the local mm. and yet engaging in, as you say, this worldly discourse, this mm. global mm. traffic and well, how that works. It seems to me that the local is always engaging in worldly discourse in some manner. Uh -huh. It is whether we are able to discern it and whether we are able to comprehend it. And yeah. so I think the, the question is more like how do you actually influence the exhibitionary yeah. apparatus of the metropolis so to, this, be, to be able to discern. Does this mean it all, this not all but much of it comes back to your role as the curator or any curator's role? Uh, the, the, role of, the role of the museums. Yeah, the role of the museum and, and the role of the academy, not just I mean, the curator is this sort of a uh, slightly overburdened creature who, who doesn't really do all of all of that heavy lifting. Uh -huh. uh, many times it's the education department that's doing the heavy lifting. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It seems quite a lot of the artworks you show are doing that lifting. Yeah. Uh, but that's, uh, I mean, I guess this person is concerned about cultural identity trapping, which I guess means essentializing certain identity yeah, in the that's process. Right. That's right. And and the, the move, the, the, the point is to actually move away from that sort of cultural identity trapping and to, to say that, you know, the color of my mind and the color of my skin are two different things. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that, that le yeah. legitimate inheritance of world culture is, is all about moving away from those traps. Yes, yes. The question from the floor. Somewhat on that point uh, brought up by that question of the, and, and, the, and a previous question by uh, Professor Batchin, this issue of complexity, you bring up, of course, the, the complex accretions of influences and whatnot. Um, do you find yourself uh, drawn to that? Uh, and do you find the other artists are drawn to that issue of, uh, of that approach to um, showing the complexity of their, of their circumstances in the global context or the worlding context, if we refer to it that way? Because uh, if you think of uh, Nil Mashek and Gulab Muhammad Sheikh's works uh, and their their ways of looking at their at I would say within a position of cultural, you know, local, geographical, and uh, and other and other um, uh, built environments and, and geographical environments, they're really locating themselves throughout throughout. If we look at a retrospective of their works um, within a broader context uh, that has uh, multiple meanings and, and, uh, and approaches to it that doesn't really sort of look only, of course, at South Asia, but beyond. And, um, and that makes the work so interesting. But do you find yourself drawn to that kind of complexity as a curator, um, 
as opposed and or, or rather my real question is can you find example can, do you think of or look for examples that are relatively simple that can extract that can extend to that broader complexity because that's or that would be challenging wouldn't it Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. We could repeat some elements of the question just in case that right. online audience could not Yeah, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of reduce your question, if I may, Matthew, somewhat, yeah. somewhat uh, brutally into a qu question around a polarity between the simple and the complex. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, a large number of artists, uh, playwrights, singers, dancers from different parts of the newly decolonizing world were offered um, fairly uh, interesting opportunities, uh, both by the Soviet satellite countries, not by the Soviet Union, strangely enough, but by the satellites of the Soviet Union and by the UK and the USA and France and Ger West Germany at that time uh, to undertake um, extended residencies, two years, three years at a time. Uh, uh, a number of artists went back to their home countries practicing sometimes a kind of hard edge abstraction, a la the free world. The art of the free world went back to the provinces uh, via these sort of mechanisms of the Cold War uh, battle over hearts and minds. Uh, so there was a sort of uh, pared down, seemingly pared down, seemingly austere abstraction that arrived in places like Bandung, Indonesia uh, in the 1960s. It also arrived in places like Baroda, India in the 1960s. Uh, this sort of um, uh, away from complexity, uh, a simple statement of color, form, surface, texture. And then you realize that actually those statements are not simple at all. Color, form, surface, texture are complex statements. Uh, so a new kind of complexity starts arriving in the guise of a pared down simplicity. Uh, and and uh, along that, along with that comes the, the sort of new new wisdom of you know the art of the free world looks like this. The art of the unfree world is figurative didactic, communist. So, so out of the level of complexity arrives. So, so there, there, there are there are ways to 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 think about that experience of of um, international and the participation in different kinds of worldings during the 1960s and 70s. That actually, when you start thinking about it, uh, does moves away from that polarity entirely, um, and and the the. The simple pole doesn't exist. But again, I guess the question is what role does interpretation play in revealing that complex simplicity? Or, mm. I mean, again, it sounds like the curator again has a yes. very significant role. Absolutely, here. absolutely. Yeah, the curator does, uh, as as does the the historian of art who writes books. Um, yeah. and the person who puts puts these things into the public arena, whether whether they are whether they are a clown or or a curator, uh, they 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 are the ones that actually provide um, the opportunity for these to become part of the public domain. I have a question uh, from an online listener uh, asking your opinion of the efforts by some Western institutions to decolonize their spaces. Ooh. And are there dangers in that for artists from outside the center? Uh, the question that says, is it problematic recentering and maintaining power for these institutions as a form of decentralizing or in the form of decentralizing oh, and diversifying knowledge production? Does, yeah, it's a fairly complex question. That's the gist of it, I think. Uh, I think it's a necessary process. Uh, it is a process that uh, has started recently. It is being pursued with more zeal in some places, less so in other places. Um, I, 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 I don't think that it is a necessarily dangerous um, situation. Uh, How I would I know a decolonized space when I saw it? Is that they're yeah, purchasing that's right. work from the third world or the no, and that, that, that's, that does not decolonize no. it at all. I mean, so, so what, there, what is a, there, is, there is a sense of, of um, ticking boxes. There is a sense of um, 
tokenistic uh, gestures towards acquisition and display um, that that can masquerade as decolonization. And I I I, I agree with. Uh, my Gurinji colleague Brenda Croft in saying that in fact decolonizing an institution is not possible. Uh -huh. Institutions, um, whether they are universities or, or, or museums, are by their very nature, um, genetically, structurally, um, they operate within a particular institutional logic that um, you know to decolonize them you'd have to blow them apart. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you, you, you know, it's usually not wise to do so if you are sitting inside <laughs> <laughs> with the bomb in your lap. Yeah. Yeah. But is there ways in which contemporary artists and indeed contemporary curators have to? Yes, and, and, and in fact, and absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely, very, very carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, the, the, I mean, I would, I would run, I would run away from from the sort of really zealous. Um, attitudes that sometimes appear in terms of um, uh, representing the underrepresented. Uh -huh. So <coughs> some action is possible. Yeah. And necessary. And necessary, yeah. One well, thing that struck me while I was looking at the, the quotations you had from 1949 and 1950, mm. uh, don't we need the first century for Asia and South Asia? Don't we need a project for Africa? Surely now we need somebody like yourself to do the first century of independent struggles and decolonization of Asia and South Asia and the way in which artists play the role. We need somebody to write that book and do that exhibition. I'm just putting that in your lap with the bomb to give you. Yeah, that is something I think about quite often and um, um, dream about a lot. Uh -huh. The model that you to achieve, do you think? Resource. <sighs> Time. Um, it would be a great project just because people like myself are so ignorant of these histories, um, especially of Southeast Asia, I have to say, but I hope you get that time and those resources. Are there any questions from the floor uh, while we still have Chaitanya with us? People are stunned into conflict of silence. Well, let me thank you on behalf of our audience here and our audience online for your lecture and your uh, question and answers, the commentary you've just been giving us. Lots of food for thought, uh, introduced us to artists that most of us or some of us have not encountered before, and that's fantastic in itself. And wish you all the luck with the um, the big idea and all the resources that you're going to need. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Shaitan.